listening to Jonesy's Jukebox on KLOS. That was the Rolling Stones, Gimme Shelter. And before that was uh, Old It Breaking News. Black Angels, Bad Vibrations. And then we had Uncle Acid and the Deadbeats, I'll Cut You Down. And then we started off with Jane's Addiction, Mountain Song. Beautiful. And we're here with Nathan Fletcher. How are you? Oh, I'm well. Thank you, Steve Jones. Nice to see you again. <laughs> again, yes. It's, that's a funny story. I met him, when was that? 2014, 11, 12? Something. He, Jay Adams was still alive. And uh, I was hanging out with Jay, and you were hanging out with him. Yeah, and we crossed paths. Yeah, and here we are again for the second time. And he still don't know who I am. That's funny. No, it's great, all right? Yeah, that's yeah, good. Because then, you know, when you first came in, you looked at me, you're like, who's this guy? You know, you have that look of, like, when you don't know someone. Well, no, I feel that way today, just period, because I was doing a phone interview with some lady who uh, who knows who it is. And then you were coming out, are you going over there? And so yeah, I was, yeah, like, yeah. caught in the middle. And then, uh, yeah, no, here we are. Here we are, best of friends now. <laughs> Um, we got to go and visit the Duke, but when we come back, we'll have a bit of chit, chit chat about the documentary. Ten four. That's 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 you know you're working it right. You, you yeah, get, we're on it. Yeah, no, I know you're on it. I watched it last night, all the way through. Oh yeah. Not five minutes, all of it. Well, that's cool. It kept you there. Yeah, I like I like that. I like that stuff. So you must have been happy to see how I portrayed or how they portrayed Jay. Because um, that's who Jay was to me, and as a friend, obviously you're the same. He was a hero. Yeah. You know, and uh, there were certain things that maybe didn't, you know, portray him as that as a surfing and skateboard icon. And so I was really happy with that part. OG. Yeah. He was an OG, for sure. Wild man. <laughs> for sure, wild man. Yeah. We'll be back in a little bit. We're here with Nathan Fletcher. And the documentary is called uh, uh, Water Something. What's it called? Heavy Water. Heavy Water. We'll be back in a little bit. Jonesy's Jukebox is back. On the Rock of Southern California, 95.5 KLOS. You're listening to Jonesy's Jukebox. And it is 129 right now. We're here with Nathan Fletcher, surfer extraordinaire. What do you think of uh, that other dude, older guy, that has a, uh, he makes a, uh, Laird, Laird Hamilton? Um, you know, I think really highly of Laird. He's done uh, amazing things. He's done so much for our sport. Uh, all I could say is Laird's gnarly, you know, and uh, he's doing his thing and obviously... He's a, he's a big surf guy. Though, well, right? yeah, yeah, but he, he's big wave. Um, but everything, it's like, oh, if a fire happens, like in the Malibu Canyon, it's like he's good, puts the pump in the pool and holds off the fire. His house don't burn down. If the hurricane hits in Kauai, he's loading up the Zodiac. He's he's saving the people. Um, you know, he's doing trips. So as a human, on a human level, he's just a radical guy. Superhuman. Well, he's just, yeah. And so it's uh, he's pushed the level in big wave surfing. And he's definitely, you know, the pinnacle of, we'll say, gnar. Yeah. But, um, you know, everybody fits. It takes all types to make a hole. And so he's definitely a, a big chunk of a hole. And so then there's the little chunks and the fragments. And so it all, you know, we all make it happen. Yeah. So when did you start doing this documentary? Um, they started a couple of years ago. I want to say three years ago. And the way it started was they asked me for an interview. And then um, if you saw it, you saw the events in the movie. And so when yeah. I did the interview and I went through these uh, events in my life, you know, it, it, it's so uh, empowering. It gives, you know, it makes me tear. And so when they did the interview, I, obviously, I started crying through it, you know. And then it was like, oh, then they called me back like a couple of days later and they said, oh, we got a movie. And I was like, yeah, uh, sure, you know, whatever, like on me, whatever. So then I was like, okay, if this is true, I want to be able to jump out of a helicopter if you're really going to do this movie. The acid drop. Yeah, and so the guy's like, oh, no problem, we could do that. And I'm like, yeah, sure, I'll believe it when I see it. You're dealing with, you know, big things. I don't know, I just can't, my brain doesn't comprehend that. But he came back, had it all lined up, did it. And so um, it all happened naturally. It just... Were you the first a, person to do that? 
jump out of a plane on your surfboard. Uh, yeah. Called cool the acid drop. Yeah, people have jumped out with it with their board and just kind of jumped off or done whatever. But to actually complete it A to B and right away, um, yeah, I was the first to do it. And it, but it. But it took you a couple of tries, right? Yeah, and in my head, I wanted to do it. At, you know, obviously, I tell this to other people, but when I was thinking about it growing up and watching skateboarding and the guys jumping off things and then Danny Way jumping out of a helicopter, and so that's where I got the idea. But you don't think about all this, uh, you know, the moving parts of situations. And so in my head, I was thinking, oh, 20 feet, like 50 feet, oh, whatever, you know, your ego and all that wants to be some superstar. But in reality, to get the job done with the permits, with the insurance, with the FAA, with the helicopter pilot, with the cameras, with the production, um, it was a huge deal. And so then it was like I started trying. It was like, oh, this is way harder than uh, what my brain imagined. Yeah, yeah. And so the point was just get it done that day, no matter what the case was. And so I did it, but it wasn't to what I would have liked to do it. or You know what I mean? I would have liked to have done it higher and on a bigger wave and all those things. But that's And then surf. Like, yeah. And like so, a long surf after you jumped out as opposed to a small you didn't go that long, did you? After well, you? no, because the wave died. Yeah. Um, but the point that was after the fact of the climax was basically boom to boom. Yeah, yeah. And so so I did that. And um, that was all to get a budget to finance the rest of the movie. So they did the stunt. So Red Bull would find it. So um, it was just how it happened and yeah. to get some money together to be able to make a movie. Have you done it again since? No, I wouldn't do it again. That's it? Yeah, just the risk and to reward isn't enough. And... Um, you know, it's just, I just, it's off the checklist. When you say you don't like, uh, you don't like, um, to, you, you know, it's not your thing to, you, you thought about a documentary and all that, but, and there's that one shot of you where you're, you know, that amazing shot that, um, you're coming through that wave, you, you eventually come off. Yeah. Chopo. Yeah. But it's like, it, it's, the photo is like insane. Yeah. It's insane. But what would you have felt like if that photographer weren't there and that wasn't documented would you feel still like you would need to well that's the whole thing be in surfing because if you don't got a picture it didn't happen yeah so, exactly so basically it wouldn't have happened if you didn't get a photo but um in my heart i would have known it yeah it's just in so it was interesting because there was a contest and it was a, a WCT and that was in between the semifinal and the final day. And you weren't really in. I'm not it. in any of that. Yeah. yeah, I hadn't been since 90. But anyways, and so all the cameras, all the people were there because of that. And so there was all these coincidences that happened to make this such a magnificent uh, ride and so publicized because other people have done things, but just it's all about the publicity right and uh so and then the story like we're telling it now you know so you're recollecting yeah. it and you're going over yeah. it and you're telling people and then it ingrains it in their head and then after so long it becomes some movie yeah <laughs> you know what i mean yeah so it's all good it's just uh if somebody didn't get it i wouldn't be here today but you're still surfing right oh every day religiously we'll you, call it but nothing insane well, more you still do the big, big just waves. More, uh, I'm, I prove my point. How about that? Yeah. And so, out of respect for the ocean and my family, and myself, and in living through all these circumstances, I just try and do it on the level that I know uh, is safe, and that I'm going to come home, and also to get a little bit of enjoyment in the rush that it gives you in the sun, and you know, yeah, all the things that you get out of surfing. And I want to surf till I'm 80. Yeah, and you can do right. Yeah, if you take care dudes, of old yeah. dudes, you still do it. There, yeah. Some of them are in the documentary. Yeah. My grandpa, I took him on a surf trip. He was 85. You're a family of, of surfers, though. Yes. You got, how many brothers do you have? I have one brother, and he's a surfer. He kind of did the aerials. My father and my mother met on the beach at Makaha in the 60s because my mom's older sister was a professional surfer, first-time women's world champion. So that's why my grandpa was there with his daughters. And so that's where my parents met because my mom's sister had my dad's board. And so my dad went over to get his board from the sister and then saw my mom. But she was too young. She was 14 or something at the time. And so then the contest came back the next year and they ended up hanging out. And and they've been together ever since. And so uh, it all started on the beach at Makaha, really. Do you ever have any run-ins with sharks? Well, my neighbor lost his leg to one about two years ago, right across the street from our house. In Hawaii. Yeah. And then, uh, you know, I've seen him, but I just try and, I don't know, we go dive with them and stuff. You know, they're really a lot like dogs. Like if you go under them and under their belly, 
you turn you're surprising them well they're just they, you turn into you know it's a problem so it's like oh they're gonna get you so they just they behave certain ways and people who know them really well uh they just act a certain way so you can kind of cruise with them and then if you act a different way oh then you're like you know you're a predator yeah. to them and so it's like they get scared yeah and so it's interesting how uh people that know them and how they behave but i don't really look for them or see them or uh because if you see them you're okay because they're smart enough you're not going to see the one that's going to bite you yeah. you know what i mean they know what's up yeah um what why am i a bay yes i you could you can see it from from the moon it has that classic church there that white block and uh i you know when i was when i was over there i was hanging out with owen wilson he was doing that movie uh what the hell was that called oh man what was it called it was a surf movie kind of oh jeez. anyway when i first went over there with him and his brother and a couple of others we're in that bay why am i a bay late at night we thought we'd go to a late swim and we're all there just <laughs> just paddling and all of a sudden I feel something tug on my leg and I thought it was a bleeding shark and it was Owen Wilson pulling on my leg yeah. oh man it, I really thought I was over it was over <laughs> he I, got you huh he really did man I really did thought I was gonna have a heart attack but uh that's the closest I've come to surfing I've never surfed I love watching it like do it the stuff you do I mean it's crazy I mean you surfers they just live and breathe surfing they don't talk about anything else right well some of them don't but you know if like for me like i was telling you about the stories in my life and being a rock fan and and a heavy metal fan and you know like when i was 12 years old it was either the choice was either to go to uh the u.s championships or go to monsters of rock at la coliseum um with metallica i think it was like van halen scorpions yeah so i chose to go to monsters of rock because it was a huge deal in my life and uh and so it's funny so there is other sides of it and then the other top guys they have enough like john john who's the world champion he has enough to do whatever he wants he goes and hangs out with like the uh olympic sailing team or he flies planes or you know what i mean they're like on a you use ride bikes too right J yeah, jumping up yeah um and so those are different like i love skateboarding i love snow i love motorcycles um i wouldn't necessarily say that those are different things because they're all kind of related in in my um in my brain and they i mean i think it's all connected you know yeah it's just loving to go have fun but yeah it's um you know different people do different things some guys uh like golf and so for me skateboarding punk rock heavy metal uh surfing those were all combined into my childhood that's what i looked up to that's what i like other people they uh they watch football you know guys are real football fanatics and they're on tour so they look at their heats like it's a game yeah, yeah. and they train like you know and so there's just different aspects and there's guys who are paddlers or long distance paddlers but they're big wave riders and so they're more of like wear the visor upside down and play volleyball kind of guys you know what i mean so it's just you live and breathe it yeah you've got to, to be a pro right really but there's other guys who have different hobbies but when it all comes down to it it all stems from surfing yeah so tell me your black sabbath story uh okay should I, i'll be quick so anyways um i'm a diehard ozzy osbourne black sabbath randy rhodes fan uh and i have been you know for many years since i was 12. and so uh me and my friend anthony van england had the chance to go see the uh you know whatever that was the oz fest at san bernardino and so he was friends with kelly osbourne through jason dill and the osbourne family show or whatever on the skateboard side of it so he can get us free tickets or whatever we get there and so he tells me because he has these aussie records already signed and framed and everything and so he's telling me just bring your aussie records to uh you know the show you never know what's going to happen so we get to the show and then he sees kelly osborne um his friend so she's oh hey how's it going blah 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 and then she's like oh will you do us a favor or will you do my dad a favor and and so anthony's like oh sh you know what is it and and uh she says oh the guys in iron maiden said they don't want to come on after ozzy after the dinosaur this and that and so would you guys be willing to throw eggs at iron maiden when they come on stage for us and uh so anthony says <laughs> sure but the only stipulation is you got to get your dad to sign these two records for my friend so she says no problem and we'll be done so i go get the records come back now she has her security and she gets about 10 of us and we have backstage passes whatever tickets for wherever but we're not right down in front 
So she gets us right in front. She tells us, okay, well, let him play a song, and then I'm going to give you the cue. And so she lets him play one song, do, 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 do. Then uh, she's, okay, now. And it was like, boom, we all started throwing eggs. And, you know, Bruce Dickinson, when he sees, like, one person spit, he's stopping the concert, and, like, he's really, <laughs> you know what I mean? It's not like he's like, oh, spit whatever whatever yeah so it's like all of a sudden eggs are coming he's like not one and so now he's like looking around he goes and then he's like oh and he goes to say something and i guess sharon osborne was backstage and so right when he went to say something she pulled the power on him power outage done <laughs> so he couldn't even say anything oh uh, but the greatest part about the whole thing was then ozzy had to fill up whatever 90 minutes instead of 70 or whatever the set time is yeah because there was all this extra time and so i and it was Bill Ward was playing drums, which I think it was one of his last times, and that was the main reason because it was all the original members, yeah. which was hard to see because you would see Sabbath maybe with like a different drummer or whatever, you know. And so, yeah. so they played every song that I know or have heard um, all the way through, and I feel like Ozzy was just really had it out that night to prove to everybody that he wasn't a dinosaur. Yeah. And so I felt like he had something to prove. So his show and his performance and his passion that night was at an all-time high yeah. and, and uh it was really great i got done i had uh, speak of the devil signed on the front i had master of reality signed on the back and um those are my only autographs pretty much i've ever even wanted and got and uh that was my aussie sabbath story and, that's a great story yeah so thank you thanks for repeating it i appreciate it yeah we're gonna play a bit of aussie there you go sabbath for you into the void you got the documentaries called heavy water it's in theaters june 13th and it's very good. I watched it in bed last night. Very entertaining if you like surfing. Even if you don't care for surfing, it's still crazy. Crazy, the, th the things that's going on in there. Do you ever get, like, terrified? You must have got terrified. Like, what the hell? You actually talk about it. All of the dudes talk about... Well, it's post-traumatic stress now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's great. <laughs> Nathan Fletcher, Jonesy's Jukebox, Black Sabbath. Mm. 